Hello, everybody, and welcome to this presentation on Autodesk Fusion Generative for Manufacturing. My name is Mike Fiedler, and co-presenting with me is Apollo Vandenberg. We are Enterprise Simulation Specialists uh, here at Autodesk, and, and also with us is our colleague Anton Fedosayev, and he's going to help out with anything that comes in in the Q&A today as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Taking a look at the agenda, of course, we'd like to welcome you to today's presentation. And we are going to take a look at what is generative design in terms of the manufacturing process primarily. Um, you will see in one of the upcoming slides that we don't necessarily want to limit your thought process to generative design. It certainly has applications outside of manufacturing, and, and we will touch upon that briefly. We will also uh, provide a brief demonstration of how the product works. So uh, we have a, a walkthrough presentation uh, recorded of, of what that workflow is, so you can get it uh, kind of in a, in a nutshell, if you will, but then we will also have a model open and ready to, to deep dive into any specific questions you have. So as you watch that demo, what I would encourage you to do is if you see anything there that you would like some additional information on it, just make a little bit of a note. Um, and then you will see that we will discuss what your next steps are uh, if you want to learn more about the software. And then when we open it up for question and answer, you are certainly welcome to, to post your question within the questions panel, uh, and we can address it in the questions panel. Or, um, you know, if it requires us to, to open up the software and, and say, you know, hey, Mike or Apollo, can I take a little bit uh, deeper look at, you know, whatever specific menu, we are, we're happy to do that. So that's just a little bit about the, the workflow that we're going to go through or the, the agenda that we're going to go through today. And, Hopefully you can get uh, a lot out of it. So uh, let's first start with why do we care? So uh, when Apollo and I were first putting this course together uh, or this information together, we thought to ourselves, you know, why, why should somebody care uh, about generative design? So maybe you've heard about generative design and so that made you click on the, the webinar to attend. But really, you know, after this presentation today, um, why might you utilize it, right? Uh, why would you put generative design into your workflow? Well, we put two real world examples together here for you. And on the left hand side, uh, you can see this seat belt bracket that was done by General Motors. And so they took a multi part assembly and utilized generative design. You can see it rotating there, spinning there to to make it a single part and really part consolidation is a twofold motivator one is the optimization for mass so where we have an initial assembly of multiple parts when we put it into generative design potentially we can end up with a lighter weight single part uh, that is you know optimized for the mass so that helps with the weight savings and of course in the automotive world we know that uh, you know uh, mileage uh, MPG is a big thing, right? So, so trying to get more miles per gallon out of the vehicle uh, is a big deal. And then second of all, the ability to reduce the so supply chain costs associated with each one of those parts and its unique supplier, right? Less inventory, less concerns uh, about the number of suppliers and the costs of the individual components that go into that assembly. And then on the right-hand side there, you can see a, a wheelchair where a portion of that wheelchair has uh, components that have been done with generative design. So that allows them to be more versatile, to be customizable, and, and almost to a degree a, a fashion item. So uh, why could, or you know, why would somebody want to do that with uh, a product like that? Uh, it can be tailored to each person's unique measurements, right? So instead of making kind of a one size fits all sort of thing, um, the parts can be interchanged as the person grows from uh, perhaps a young adult into adulthood and, and also interchangeable based on needs. So, uh, you know, they might want to help have some input on what that specific design looks like. Uh, and with generative design, it's able to output many, many 
designs. So we can explore those different designs and, and determine maybe which one looks looks best as well as which ones fit the needs of that person uh, as far as loads that it would need to withstand. Okay, so just two examples there about, uh, you know, to let you know that it's already out there, it's being utilized, uh, and a few different things that you might want to consider uh, when you think about your, your own product. So at a high level, before we start to drill down into generative design, what is Autodesk Generative Design? Well, it's a design exploration technology. So you might be familiar with something like the AutoCAD products that we offer or the Inventor products that we offer, and, and you know how to operate those or uh, to give it some other products, uh, a SolidWorks or a Pro Engineer, right? When you start with these products, uh, you have a design in mind, right? So you start drawing lines, rectangles, arcs, circles, and then you extrude those out into the design that you want. With generative design, uh, the input is really what are my loads, what are my constraints, what are the materials that I can utilize, and then a program simultaneously generates multiple CAD-ready solutions for you, and then you can explore those and determine which one is the best outcome for you, uh, and then you can explore that further as well uh, uh, in terms of, you know, what materials can I utilize? Is this a design that looks aesthetically pleasing, for instance, uh, and so on. So uh, to get into that idea a little bit further, we're going to first take a look at the, the typical perhaps current design process that you go through, right? So uh, your boss or your manager comes to you and they say, hey, we have uh, a new product that we need to produce, right? So what do you do? You come up with several different concepts, right? So we can see here on this, this timeline of time to market that maybe you can come up with six different concepts in that phase of the process, right? You only have so much time uh, in which you can do this. So you have a couple different concepts, right? And then from there, you need to validate one of these concepts. Um, and perhaps along the way, in that evaluation process, you find out that there is some manufacturability issue. Uh, perhaps that material is not available or it's cost prohibitive. Uh, perhaps with that initial concept, the the loads are are going to make that concept not viable so you have to go back to a different concept and again you evaluate it uh, and then finally you know settle upon something that is able to be produced so you can see on the right hand side there we have a rather traditional looking motorcycle swing arm and there's a fair amount of time that is spent in the iteration phase right going back and forth with these concepts and determining determining what is manufacturable, and then you have your design to production phase as well. Once you decide upon uh, a, a, a viable concept, then of course you've done all the testing and then ultimately into the production phase. When we take a look at generative design, how does it vary? Uh, generative design produces for you multiple validated manufacturable options, right? And the reason for that is because the manufacturing processes are included as input into the program. So you're going to specify with the program, uh, perhaps I want to explore 3D printing of this. Perhaps I want to use uh, three-axis milling. Perhaps I want to use um, a water jet um, or a, a 2D cutting process for this. So you are inputting the manufacturing criteria or options for it to explore along with what the material is, along with what the constraints are, as well as what the loads are. And generative design will output all these different options uh, for you to explore. And then from there, you can select one of these that you want to go ahead and produce. So what you can see from that is we're saving all the the iteration time of going back and forth between these these different possible options. So we shorten the iteration phase, we shorten the design and production phase, uh, and that yields for you then a productivity increase. And you can see on the right hand side the a a outcome uh, from these multiple outcomes of of generative design. All right. So the benefit there is really 
lots of validated manufacturable options, really the output of generative design. And we'll get into looking into that a little bit uh, further, uh, exploring that a little bit more. Uh, before we move on into those different outputs though, uh, we want to differentiate here. What's the difference between topology optimization that exists uh, inside of the inventor product and also within the fusion product uh, versus generative design? So we're going to put this in terms of a transportation analogy. So on the left-hand side here, this will be our topology optimization, right? And so maybe you make a product today uh, and that would be in making that product or in shipping um, uh, the, the transportation analogy, you go from point A to point B, right? You use a particular material and it looks a certain way or in terms of the ship, it takes a certain route, right? With topology optimization, what topology optimization does is it takes your current part and it figures out how to make it more lightweight. So it just removes material from your current design. So in terms of the transportation analogy, that would be the same thing as finding a faster shipping route, right? So if we go through the Panama Canal, uh, we can make it 60% faster. In terms of the part design with topology optimization, that would be maybe we can make this part uh, you know, 60% lighter by removing material in places where that material is not needed. So that would be topology optimization. And it certainly has its place. I'm not putting it down at all. Uh, I utilize the product or the utility uh, in instances. But really, what's the difference then to generative design? Uh, well, when we look at generative design, it does that, right? You can give it an existing product and say, I want to make this design more lightweight and it can figure out what your critical load paths are. Uh, but in addition to that, it gives you different outcomes as well. So uh, in transportation, adding a truck route, adding a train route, adding a plane route, right? So each of these different uh, means of transportation or shipping uh, have different uh, variables associated with them, right? How much cargo they can carry, what is the speed of delivery, how much security do they have, and, and certainly not least of all, uh, what, if, what is the cost, right? So when we talk about generative design, um, some of these different things that you can put into the program are, let's explore different materials, right? So those materials will have different costs associated with them. Uh, you're gonna explore what are my different manufacturing methods. So those different manufacturing methods have different speeds with which you can output parts. Uh, they have different costs associated with them. Certainly, you know, whether you have these these different manufacturing methods available to you in-house or whether that then becomes a, a product that you have to outsource the, the production of, All right? So hopefully, hopefully that helps to explain a little bit of the difference between topology optimization and generative design. So generative design can certainly do that topology optimization, but also adds in uh, a lot more. And when you get all these different outputs, uh, then again, you can explore what is best for you. So another thing that we stopped and paused uh, about as we were putting together this content was, well, you know, somebody says, okay, I, I kind of understand that generative design is going to give me um, a lot of different outcomes. Uh, I understand that people are using it today, so it's a viable technology. Uh, but we said, you know, when, you, a question that you might have is, when am I going to utilize it? When ex exactly should I apply it uh, to the work that I do? And we determined that there are three, at least three different cases when you might use it. And one is new product design creation, right? Um, so again, this goes back to the example, perhaps your manager or your boss says, hey, there's something new, there's a new product that we wanna create. Uh, and that's an aha moment for you, right? You could say, I wanna use generative design to approach this. And with the generative design then, uh, what we can do is then determine where is that material needed, uh, what type of material am I going to use, what other alternatives do I have versus, you know, as I take a pencil and a piece of paper and I start to sketch out what this thing might look like, well, maybe I want to use generative design to allow generative design to explore some different geometries as far as the, the outcome, right? Uh, so that would be a great case to utilize generative design when you have a completely new product and, and you want the program to do the heavy lifting of coming up with these different shapes, uh, the ideation of those. 
And then the second case is part consolidation. So right now you might have assemblies that are either costly to manufacture or perhaps they're hard to manufacture as they are current, currently done. Uh, you can utilize generative design to figure out how to create a single part out of uh, what is currently an assembly. And in doing so, potentially you can reduce those costs, perhaps you can explore different manufacturing methods, and perhaps you can reduce the raw material that gets utilized in that process. So uh, if you have an assembly like that, it's uh, a possibility to run it through the generative design and see if it can assist that way. And then lastly, uh, part enhancement. So not only with new designs, but if you have current designs that you kind of look at and you say, you know, this is the way we've done it. We've, we've always done it that way. Uh, but I have a feeling uh, maybe it's a little bit over-designed. Um, perhaps we can lightweight it or um, perhaps we can make it out of a different material so we can reduce some costs that way. So generative design can certainly help you take existing designs and figure out, you know, how might we make this different? Can we make it lighter? Can we make it a different material? Can we make it out of a different manufacturing process? So generative design can help with all those things. Um, and again, I don't want to limit it. You're thinking to, you know, these are the three areas exactly where generative design is going to apply, but we're just trying to help, you know, spur some thought about when might you use it uh, and how it might be applied to, to your processes. All right. And then talking about uh, generative design and how it applies, you know, we are aware that, you know, the goal for any engineering activity is to find that balance between performance and cost, right? And we are also aware that engineers are limited in time and energy that you can spend on any singular task, right? So I really think that that's where generative design comes in, is it gives you all these different outputs that you can explore and probably comes up with these outcomes a lot faster than, than any single person or maybe just a few people are able to come up with some different design ideas. So I really think that it'll help uh, in, in that area. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, price performance curve, per price performance curve before we get into taking a look at the software here. And, and that is really, again, the, the cost versus the performance and we're gonna start this with a another simple transportation analogy, right? So if your objective were to design a new car, uh, I think it's pretty clear that you could target three different areas of the market, right? At least. Uh, so you could do a, a high cost, high performance car. You could do something that is more uh, towards the masses, right? Uh, medium performance, perhaps. Um, reliable, I'm not saying anything about the reliability, but maybe it doesn't accelerate as fast as the high cost car over here. Um, um, but again, the cost would be, be perhaps something that's more mainstream or, or middle market. Or you could say, I'm gonna go after those people who maybe have a tighter budget and go with something that's more lower cost. But then also we know that perhaps it might be a little lower performance, right? You're not gonna be able to put in uh, a, a high performing engine that's going to cost lots of money uh, to produce the type of output that something at the other end of the spectrum uh, is going to give you. And then of course, uh, you can see all the dots along this curve. We could, we don't necessarily have to fall within one of these three buckets. We could certainly be somewhere in between any one of those three different outcomes, right? So let's take a look at something maybe uh, more manufacturing centric. So uh, there was a bracket that GE Aerospace was using some years ago. Uh, and you can see what was the original design in the upper left hand corner there. And uh, they wanted to redesign this. Uh, can we make it out of some different materials? Can it look differently? Uh, can we lightweight it? So they put forth this challenge to the GrabCAD user community and said, hey, uh, here's our current design and here's how we have it constrained. So there's the four bolt holes and, and they told people where it was constrained. And then in the two lugs at the top of it, they provided these are the different loads that it needs to withstand. So it had some vertical load, some horizontal load, some off axis load. Uh, and they said to the user community, hey, can you guys figure out um, or suggest how might we design this part a little bit differently? 
and the user community delivered. So here's just some sample outputs of the many, many uh, outputs that the user community generated. Um, so it's pretty awesome, right? That you get all these different design ideas uh, when you put it forth through these people. So you can see there's there's quite a few different looking outcomes there. Um, but the effort that went into this was many different users and each one of those users spending, you know, how can we envision how much some users may have spent, uh, I don't know, could have taken them 20 minutes, a half hour, and I'm sure some users spent many more hours uh, coming up with their design that would be able to withstand their provided loads. So what we're saying here is that, you know, in order to come up with all these different outcomes, it took a lot of different users and many hours uh, to come up with those different design ideas, whereas generative design, uh, hopefully that's where it's going to give you the biggest bang for the buck, right? It's going to come up with lots of different designs, lots of different outcomes for you, and then you can interrogate and figure out which one of those outcomes uh, is right for you or, or maybe help you to more quickly get to those different outcomes so that you can explore those outcomes uh, more rapidly. Okay, so speaking of those outcomes, uh, again, Generative design is going to rapidly create a lot of different outcomes for you. And then you can weigh the different trade-offs and, and figure out where you wanna be along the price performance curve. So what you can see here is one of the different output screens from generative design. Really there are uh, multiple different ways that generative design and Apollo will get into this a little bit more. There are multiple different ways that you can review the outputs of generative design. Uh, and help to determine what is going to be the best outcome for you. Uh, but what you can see here on this graph, uh, we have the, the manufacturing cost along the left-hand side and leveraging a priori. Uh, we can determine in some cases, in a lot of cases, uh, what the manufacturing cost roughly should be. Uh, and then on the on the horizontal axis, we're, we're laying out these different outcomes in terms of mass. Uh, and then the colors that you can see, if you look at the legend at the bottom, these are the different manufacturing methods that somebody input into the program and said, hey, I wanna explore this in two axis cutting and two and a half axis milling and three axis, five axis, uh, add of, uh, additive manufacturing, die cast, uh, and then an unrestricted method, right? So you get all these different outputs. And then from there, you can start to whittle it down. You say, well, uh, I don't want anything that's going to be super heavy, and maybe I'm concerned about the things that are way at the left end of the spectrum. I get that they're light, but you also need people to to believe that your product's going to be able to withstand the loads, right? So maybe I'm going to exclude everything on the far left hand end. I'm going to exclude everything on the far right, just as a hypothetical example. So let me concentrate on just this group right here. And, you know, maybe you have a certain cutoff. You don't want to worry about anything. Uh, maybe your cutoff points at, at $1,200, right? So that kind of limits you to to a certain bandwidth of, of outcomes right there. So then you can start to click on them and, and determine which one maybe is, is most suitable for, for you guys to go ahead and, and proceed exploring further with, right? So um, as we get into our next slide here, I'm gonna hand it over to Apollo and he can start to give you more specifics on you know, what that process actually looks like uh, from a, a product use standpoint. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, as Mike kind of outlined, you know, we had you know, three different thought processes as to to why you might be getting into generative design. And with this one here, kind of, we decided to focus more on that part enhancement. Um, so you know, generally, you might be starting from a from an existing CAD model. Um, you know, you're going to end up projecting certain geometries that are required for for generative design. Um, and then we're going to define those. So we're going to define certain regions as preserve or keep regions. So these are areas that we have a, a known load where we have maybe a bolted connection to uh, existing geometry. Um, and then we have uh, obstacle regions or avoidance regions. So, you know, in, in this context of looking at a suspension A-arm, we know that it has to travel, it has some range of motion, and we need clearance to uh, accommodate that range of motion. Um, so once we define all those, those parameters along with any loads and constraints, um, we can go ahead and generate and then start exploring our results. Um, so I'll walk through real quick a, a quick demo of it and then um, 
as we get into uh, the q and I, I have this model open, so if there are specific questions, we can dive into it. Um, you know, as Mike mentioned, there are uh, a number of different manufacturing methods that we are accommodating. Uh, so we can look at additive manufacturing where you can specify, you know, a, a given overhang angle and thickness to the walls um, based off of what your printer that you have available, what it can do. Um, die casting is currently in tech preview, but it is available to everybody at this point. Um, and then as well as three and five axis milling, two and a half axis and two axis cutting. Um, for the three, five and two and a half axis milling, you can also specify parameters about the tool bit. So if you wanted to look at, you know, we're gonna do stuff with a three axis mill, but I wanna test, uh, you know, a, a 10 millimeter, 15 millimeter and a 30 millimeter bit to see if that was the only bit we were using, you know, what's the, the shape that we might get out of it. Um, th those are different types of combinations that people tend to, to look at as well. So, um, you know, what that process looks like, uh, starting with the assembly uh, in Fusion here, you know, we're gonna look at this suspension A-arm. And uh, first thing we're gonna do is go from the design workspace into the generative design workspace. Um, the benefit of coming into the workspace is that we can make model edits that are unique to this part uh, or to this assembly and not have it propagate back into our design, but it will be associative. So I can grab certain features like the surfaces of where the mounting locations are, you know, thicken those surfaces to create new bodies to be my preserve regions. I can sketch additional bodies to, to be obstacle regions such as, you know, the chassis as it's rotating. Um, you know, bolts that are coming through or bolt heads. Um, in some cases too, from a mentality perspective, you might even have to think about tool access. So while the bolt and the bolt head can fit, you know, can you actually put the bolt, you know, into that location? Um, once we have that defined, you know, all the geometry set up, we can start defining the preserves, uh, which are gonna be these four main bodies. I just paused the video, Apollo. I I just yep. wanted to elaborate for just a second. Uh, what we're looking at here are all the model edits that were done right within the the generative design environment, right? The, the cylinders that you have here, yep. as well yep. as the, this large rectangular region, all were done um, from within the 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 generative design workspace and that model editing. So I think that is. Um, worth pausing on just for a second. As you had mentioned there, you know, we're still preserving the integrity of the original CAD um, model. Uh, these things are just allowing us to, to help set up appropriately for the, the generative design that we're about to produce. And, and you're gonna expand upon, you know, the, 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 the regions that we wanna preserve and the regions that are, are obstacles that we need to uh, have the program not generate uh, mm -hmm. design within, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good good okay. point to, to elaborate on. Uh, if you need me to pause it at any point, feel free to just mention yeah. it and I'll stop there. Can do. So yeah, as Mike was mentioned, you know, we're kind of grabbing those those four created regions where we have known loads um, to be our, our preserved geometry. Um, and then lastly, everything else that we've created are all obstacle regions for, you know, clearance, for bolts, things of that sort. Um, as we move forward, we are getting into the structural loads and structural constraints. Um, so in this case, you know, I had actually set up a number of load cases to represent all the different uh, aspects that this suspension would go through. So whether the tire is hanging, whether we're under um, weight, you know, acceleration for like the twisting action uh, across the, the rear two mounting locations, you know, turning, uh, deceleration. Um, and then actually if you can, yeah, pause it for a second here, Mike. Um, yeah. I think we yeah, hit the skipped over the objectives. Here. So, so yeah. And then as soon as we, dang, <laughs> sorry, that's right. I hit the back instead of. Yeah, so yeah. as soon as we get done with, uh, with all of the loads and constraints, we have the ability to set some target objectives. So whether we want to minimize mass or we want to maximize stiffness, um, you know, those are kind of our focal points. As we select those, we can specify 
a given factor of safety um, so as our target. So, you know, are we looking to have a safety factor of two or are we trying to shoot for something, you know, a little bit more conservative? Um, so you can kind of pick that and that will drive, drive the solver forward. Um, you can go ahead and hit play again. And then under the manufacturing constraints, this is where we will specify, you know, all of those manufacturing um, items that we mentioned. So, you know, whether we want to look at additive, whether we want to look at milling, um, you know, what tool directions for three-axis milling are we considering? Um, is it just one orientation or are we looking at, at the ability to do all of them? Um, and then materials, uh, you know, we have the ability to, to set up uh, up to seven materials. Um, so I, I tend to encourage people, you know, even though you might make this consistently out of, you know, steel and, and maybe you're considering aluminum, why not look at a couple other materials just to see uh, what insights it might give you? Um, and then from there, we have a pre-check. Uh, so the pre-check will kind of give us a sanity check on, you know, is everything set up appropriately? And then we can solve it. Um, once we get into the exploring side, we have our ability to, you know, filter based on manufacturing method, um, you know, as a method of drilling down, or maybe there's a certain mass range, as Mike was talking about, that we're looking to, to maintain. Um, so we can use these filters on the left, um, and that, that'll kind of apply to all of the tables as well. Or, or maybe we just want to sort the table and say, you know what, show me all of them, you know, in material order or in safety factor order. Uh, the last one being the, you know, graph uh, that, that Mike was showing. Um, you know, we can hover over it and see little previews of it, or we can kind of zoom in and dive in a little bit deeper to kind of compare what's going on. And if we find ones that we like, we can actually select those um, and compare them side by side. So once we have them selected, we can dive in a little bit deeper into each one of them, um, you know, rotate them around, see where things are different. You know, all the parameters and outputs are on the right as we change between the windows. We can look at the stress concentrations um, throughout the model um, and kind of compare them again between them. We also have the ability to showcase the original uh, preserve geometry and um, obstacle geometry so you can kind of see how well we adhere to, to those um, setup parameters. And then once you have a part that you like, uh, we, we can take that one part and we can promote it back into, into Fusion. Um, and then at that point, if you were to take it, so as far as like maybe one of the common questions, if you were to take it uh, back into Fusion Simulation, you know, you've already set up the model once here with all the different load cases. And so we actually read all that data back in. And so you will already have a, you know, a set up FEA solution that you can run and kind of do further validation if you'd like within within Fusion Simulation. Um, and then there's also an ability to export to ANSYS if you'd like to, to go that route as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the quick uh, demo. Like I said, uh, we have a little bit more as far as, uh, you know, things that we can talk about here. With this last slide, and then I'm going to take presenting over so in case someone wants to talk specifically about Fusion um, and kind of the, the model itself, I have it open. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about brackets. Uh, we showcase a lot of brackets. And, um, you know, we just kind of wanted to highlight that it's not always, you know, brackets. Uh, you know, granted, a lot of things tend to, we'll say, connect components together. Um, but there are a, a wide variety of, of areas that people are leveraging generative design. So, you know, in the top left there, you see, you know, kind of a headphone design, um, kind of getting a little bit more into the aesthetics and, and kind of industrial design aspects between that and say the lampshade, um, you know, kind of just showcasing some unique, you know, features there. Um, so, so just more to kind of drive, as Mike was mentioning, the the creativity on that, you know, you can use this in a variety of methods and feel free to, you know, push the limits of what um, what, what we're doing with the software today. Um, so the last two comments, and I'm gonna steal the presentation for a second, um, is, you know, where do we go from here? And so, you know, the first item is if, uh, at the end of this webinar, um, if you'd like us to reach out to you and would like us to to dive in a little bit deeper on perhaps your models um, and, and have a, a further discussion, uh, there is a quick survey that will come up. 
feel free to answer yes to that and um, you know we will reach out to you um, second is that um, we have recently posted a learning path for generative design on our customer success learning hub so under customer success.autodesk.com under mechanical engineering you scroll down you'll see that there is a generative design and manufacturing course um, so feel free you know as well you know if you'd like to dive in a little bit further and kind of get some familiarity with you know some of the operations some of the details behind it um, feel free to come in here it's you know six kind of quick modules that you can go start to finish and uh, probably a couple couple hours in two to three hours um, so with that we'll uh, kind of open it up for any questions that you have and uh, go from there So let me look at this here. I was starting to address a, a question um, in the panel here that says, or asks, can sheet metal be a, a source part for generative design? I've only seen solid parts uh, such as the bracket. Um, I would say that um, certainly something that is on the radar it's a request that we have heard um i don't know how technical we want to get with the answer uh we could explain a little bit about how the, the generative design works uh if you think that would be helpful uh apollo i don't i don't know how deep we want to dive yeah i mean uh i, I mean I, I guess the question you know uh to some extent i could say um you know, doing thin geometry like sheet metal, it, you can leverage it as a source for preserves and obstacle regions. Um, you know, if you're trying to confine it to being, you know, a thin part, it, you know, it is possible to do that as well. Um, when we talk about sheet metal specifically, sometimes people have other ideas in mind as far as what they're looking for in terms of outputs. And so that might be a further discussion to have. Um, if if what you do is a lot of sheet metal. Um, Just to, wanna, to that, is it uh, possible to use a shape generator for sheet metal? Just, I was wondering. You mean a topology optimization? Topology route. optimization, yeah. Yeah. Um, just to, I guess to just kind of skim the surface of that uh, a little bit without getting too uh, deep in, in either technique, right? So topology optimization is taking an existing design, uh, adding a mesh, figuring out what the critical load path is through that, that mesh, and then you know basically eliminating the elements uh, that aren't heavily loaded. So the uh, the outcome of the topology optimization to a degree depends on the refinement to that mesh. So it's a challenge even there in figuring out, um, you know, how many elements you need to represent that that sheet metal, right? Um, and so the more elements that you would have um, through that sheet metal, probably the better it could handle it. And, and it's this it's a very similar challenge with. Um, with the generative design here and that we're meshing a, a large domain um, and figuring out outcomes within that domain. So when you have a sheet metal body, that's really the biggest challenge is, is just the, uh, the thickness and in, in terms or, or the size of the mesh relative to, to the sheet metal. So it's a little bit easier as Apollo was mentioning when it's a, um, you know, if it's a obstruction, um, but if it's if we're talking about outcome, it's it is a challenging thing for both. But uh, we do hear it from the user community, and it's I would say it, it it's certainly something that the the product team is uh, thinking hard about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to be conscious of some of the other questions here mm -hmm. um, to help out. So uh, 
is gender designed strictly for solid parts? Uh, can multi-body, you know, weldments be done? You know, at, at this point today, it, similar to what Mike was just mentioning, there, there are a lot of discussions going on around um, extending it, you know, beyond what we're doing today. But at, at this point, it is for, um, we'll, we'll call it single part outputs. Um, you know, as, as we showed, you know, if you're looking at it from a part consolidation perspective, you know, you might be bringing in an assembly uh, of parts uh, that would normally bolt together in some capacity and we're using preserves off of multiple parts to create a singular body output, you know, as, as that part, you know, consolidated, uh, consolidated part. Um, you know, so if, if there are things, for example, like in my example here with the the rest of the suspension, you know, as far as, you know, loads and things of that sort, um, you know, I would have to figure out, you know, how the loads transfer into, you know, that sub-assembly or, you know, into what I'm defining as my preserves. I don't know if there's anything else you'd want to add to that, Mike? No. Okay, good. Um, does generative design part made in Fusion transfer well as an OBJ in Alias? Um, I'll say, in, honestly, I haven't actually tested that. When we transfer out of, once we get the output from generative design, we do have a full T-spline that's fully editable. Um, so I, I would imagine that we should have uh, you know, pretty good transfer to Alias, but it's not something that I have specifically tested um, to see, you know, what kind of surfacing comes over. Is there a possibility to import designs from other CAD software? Um, absolutely. So Fusion has the ability, and I can show it while we're here, um, you know, has the ability to support, you know, any number of uh, CAD types uh, as well as you know, generic formats, universal formats like STEP and SAT, but, you know, we can pull in CATIA files and UG files and SOLIDWORKS files. So, um, you know, any one of those could be imported and then leveraged for generative design. So how is the price out for the outcome calculated? Uh, so this is within uh, our partnership with a priori. So they have, um, you know, their methods of determining based on, you know, features. Um, they actually have a full software suite uh, to, you know, if you were to give a part and a material and a manufacturing method um, to determine, you know, where the cost comes from, what features are driving that cost. Um, so in partnership with them, they are applying some of their their technology to our outputs and and generating that. Um, as we look at, and this will be a good thing to take a moment backwards, as we look at the setup process, um, when I go to pick materials, um, you know, we'll have some materials that will have this calculator um, icon and some that do not. And what that means is that for the a priori cost calculation, um, this material exists for a given manufacturing method versus this one that may not exist for, for, for that given manufacturing method. So if I were to go into, you know, say milling, for example, um, a priori has the ability to give us costing details, you know, based on the geometry for milling with aluminum, but not necessarily uh, aluminum, you know, silicon magnesium, which is typically used more in, in additive. Um, so that since there isn't any costing data there, we won't get a cost for, for that uh, matchup of material and, and manufacturing method. Well, so on the manufacturing method input screen where the um, quantity of units is input, right? Correct, yeah. So production as you're going through, you can kind of pick, you know, what you feel your production volume is going to be in that plays a factor into what the um, cost calculation is going to output. Um, oh, we've got a 
bunch of questions. Let me look at some of these other ones. Can we create any new shapes with generative design aside of traditional um, Rajesh, I'm, I'm not sure I follow the, the latter half of your, your question, if you don't mind um, elaborating a little bit more. I'll be glad to talk a little bit further on it. Um, how does it help reduce the mass of the object? Um, I mean, I think Mike touched on it a little bit. You know, it's, we'll say, uh, there are some aspects of our solver that are, you know, proprietary in terms of how we are doing some of the computations, but, um, you know, you could say similar to what we do with topology optimization, just apply to a little different, you know, we are looking at, you know, load paths between the preserve regions to figure out where mass is required and where mass is not required. Um, you know, in many existing parts, we, we tend to find that a lot of people have a fair amount of additional mass that may not be required and as we find new shapes some of those new shapes can also be done with uh, with less mass um, and then additionally to depending on the the manufacturing method you're getting into so for example if you are looking at additive um, you know there's a, a handful of additional operations we could do post-processing post the generative output to further lightweight and reduce mass uh, on the part. Um, one question around availability of this feature. So generative design is, um, is an extension. So there are a couple of different ways that you can get access to generative design. Um, through the level of fusion as well as, uh, you know, if you look at like the manufacturing extension um, where you would get access to some of our CAM environments as well as the generative design space. So um, between, let's say, this question and another one that asked around the, the cost of uh, generative design, um, depending on the avenue you pick, there's a slightly different cost for, for being able to get access to generative design. And then is there any way to see an environment impact as how environment friendly the part is, manufacturing materials, et cetera? You know, it's a it's an interesting question. Oh, I like uh, that question. <laughs> yeah, it's something that I know um, a handful of us have talked around internally. Um, you know, and I think it does come down to at times what uh, what manufacturing method you're choosing. But we'll say at at face value that what we're outputting today isn't giving you a direct correlation to its environmental impact. Yeah, I just uh, dropped the link. It does not answer the question directly, but we've got a course from our sustainability team where they spoke about some of the effects, right? But again, mm -hmm. it's, it's not giving the direct answer, but it yeah. has uh, some clues. So I posted the link in uh, for everybody. Thank you, Anton. Let me see if I miss any. I think we got about I everything. To that one around cost. And then there's uh, another one around can we enter cost details as per standards? Um, I, I, I'd like a little bit more information as to where that question is going, um, you know, as far as like the, the costing outputs that we do, since we're, we're leveraging a priori, a priori does have, um, I guess I'll kind of expand a little bit further there, um, in their costing 
algorithm, they do take into account um, averages around the world. So um, just because a part, you know, is uh, maybe more expensive in one region of the world than the other, um, you know, they have that variance as part of their outputs, and then we use that to kind of generate the, uh, you know, the bracket for for a given part. So when we say that the the range is between you know two to four thousand, we're we're kind of taking into account, you know, the the data that a priori has for various regions. But if there's more specifics that you're looking for around your, you know cost standards, um, please feel free to elaborate. There was one, uh, there's one, there's a point that I'll bring up. Um, I, I'm not sure that um, you touched on it. You may have while I was looking at some of the questions, so I'm sorry if I'm reiterating something that was said, but uh, in one of the questions, I, you know, somebody was asking about costing and saying some of the designs look rather elaborate, um, might be expensive to, to produce, and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, it, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the software, I think maybe one of my favorite applications of it um, thus far, you know, it, one of our um, companies that leveraged the software said, look, you know, this is this is great. We love the product, but yes, we're not going to produce anything like uh, what you see in maybe the, the top two designs here that Apollo is showing. Um, so their current workflow, what they do is they, they still leverage generative design to, to ideate and, and come up with all these different outputs. Um, but then their manufacturing of it is a lot more conventional. So based on what they see in the outcome of generative design, they say, hey, you know, we can remove material from this location and we can remove material from that location. So instead of something more, uh, what do you want to say, spider web or, or spindly thin looking uh, there in the geometry, they just go back to their CAD package uh, and start to use, you know, rectangles and circles and arcs and, and do cut extrudes uh, and build something that is ultimately, you know, that they'll produce just using, a, you know, a weldment. Um, but they still allow the generative design program to come up with uh, something that, that influences their their final design. So I think that's a great application of the program and, and something that, uh, you know, I would say is a, is a good takeaway. You know, you don't have to look at this kind of output and say, look, we're never gonna generate this. You could look at this and say, hey, that could motivate me uh, as far as what we end up uh, maybe in a more classical design or influence that that classical design and, and manufacture method. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, adding into that, um, you know, at times too, it, where we've seen people in a similar vein say say that right like that you know maybe this part is too thin it's not you know not something that I would maybe perhaps uh, want to have you know for every single outcome that we have and you could see on my screen you know how many I was getting um, with this one run um, each each one of them has a number of outputs and so we kind of progress you know and kind of show the the progression of the of the solution you know as it kind of evolves. And so there are times where some people, you know, rather than taking the absolute, you know, last iteration, um, might say, you know what, I'm going to come back at just a couple iterations because maybe maybe things aren't as, you know, wispy as, as Mike was mentioning. And and that kind of feels, you know, more in line with what we're looking for. And uh, I'll leverage this, you know, intermediate step to uh, to you know push this outcome back to fusion. Um, or, or push it out to a, you know, an STL if we would prefer that, um, rather than you know that final that final step. Um, so another comment: some parts look very thin. Is it possible to understand? Yeah, I think Mike was just commenting yeah. that back. I'll say it out loud. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you can definitely do further you know, structural analysis on these. Um, as as we export this back into a, an outcome, 
within the Fusion environment, uh, we will take, you know, and I'll kind of take a step further back, we'll take the entire setup. So as far as the, the material of that specific outcome that you are, are exporting and the right. load cases that we have assigned here, all that information. And when you go into the Fusion, when you come into the simulation workspace, you will have um, a structural analysis set up for you. Um, and then from that point, if you wanted to take it further and do, you know, whether you know, rather than just doing a linear analysis, do nonlinear or, you know, look at some sort of modal analysis, um, you can do all of that within, you know, the, the simulation workspace. Yep. Anything else you want to add? Um, I would love to see it done in in, in Fusion Simulation. Um, it, I think it's very convenient that it carries all that information over. You have a variety of different analysis types, and I pointed out in the comments, including explicit analysis. So you can do dynamic analysis, impact type stuff. Uh, but I understand that you know the the follow up question to that is always, what about other uh, simulation programs? So we we do have a, a partnership with with Ansys, so we can take that same data. Uh, to ANSYS. Uh, if you get into something else, some other uh, FEA program, you know, as Apollo showed the output, you can export the, the CAD file at least, right? So you could take that design uh, into a, a different simulation package still, right? Via step file or, or SAP file. Uh, and then you just might need to, to do your own setup as far as loads and constraints. But I I don't think that that would be a deal breaker too, right? Because you might want to explore some different types of uh, loads and constraints on that geometry for whatever uh, different types of uh, events it might need to withstand. So, uh, but yes, that certainly, certainly there are means to, to do so. Yep. All right. Did we miss anything? I think all the ones that are currently in there, we've gone through. Let me see if anybody has. Um, Great yeah. questions today, guys. I appreciate uh, you know the attendance, and I appreciate uh, making sure that the the program's going to facilitate facilitate what you'd like to do with it. Um, Helping the, to understand it. It's yeah. a good conversation today. Well, yeah, I mean, so we've got about two minutes left here. Um, I'll reiterate, you know, just once more. Uh, you know, at the close of this, uh, the webinar, you'll have a survey pop up. It's three questions, big question that we're, you know, mainly interested uh, about today. You know, if you want to have us follow up more independently, you know, with you guys, if there's something specific you'd like to, to chat about, Feel free to answer yes on that one, and uh, we will we will reach out and you know continue this discussion. Um, and then likewise, if you'd like to you know like to continue diving in uh, and learning a little bit more, feel free to um, take a peek at the generative course and and go through go through that to extend your your knowledge and some of the clicks and picks. Uh, you pasted the link in the chat too, right? Somebody did. Yeah, I just uh, posted again the... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, I appreciate everybody joining today and being so active with the, with the questions and um, yeah we look forward to talking to you at a future time all right take care thank you everybody